Hello everyone and welcome to the second flipped collab for assessment two for understanding and supporting behavior. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, I've decided to put the flipped collab um, onto YouTube using the screencast this time. Um, I just thought it would be better um, in terms of being able to access um, the presentation and that it might be easier um, yeah, just for accessing in different areas. So I hope it works out well. And um, if you prefer it in a YouTube um, format, then perhaps let me know, we can continue it on. So welcome, I hope this really helps you to make a start um, nice and early with assessment too. Um, it's not the be end and end all of everything. As I said last time, you still need to be engaging with the assessment details and in particular the rubric. Um, this is just a short presentation, just to get you started, just to give you a few ideas. Um, we will be elaborating on this in the um, interactive collab, so you'll still need to attend that or listen to the recording um, to give you the full details. Um, just think of this as a, a, a presentation to help you get started. So we have our assessment two which has a total of 2,000 words. It's worth 40% and our due date is Monday the 10th of September, which is the Monday of week nine. So what do we need to do? So we're going to be using all of the knowledge that we have developed through assessment one. So basically we have learned about behaviors and we have learned about learning behavior theory. So we are going to take those learning behavior theories. We've got behavioralism, we've had humanism, um, sociocultural, all of those same behavior theories that we've used for assessment one. We're going to use that knowledge now to apply it to these different case studies in our folio. We are going to have four resources. So this is what makes up the 2,000 words. So we have 500 words each where we're going to be analysing different resources and collecting them and showing them and explaining them. So we've got our 500 times 4, which is your, four, um, your 2,000 word total. And they're in response to scenarios presented throughout the unit. Uh, the resources you select need to respond to each scenario. So you're going to have scenario number one, um, which has got some um, sort of case study related to it. So there's a child involved. It talks about some sort of circumstances with their behavior. Um, it links to the learning materials. You're going to have to give um, present your ideas on the kind of resource that is going to, have to help support that particular student to work through um, the behavior and work through the problems that they're having. Because remember when we think back to assessment one, um, that essentially we want students to find success within their ability to interact with others and engage and develop those social skills so that they can um, ultimately be you know, successful in their schooling. Um, if you have a little bit further, look further down, um, these are the assessment details that I've stra taken straight from obviously our assessment too. So we're gonna look at um, each item in the folio um, has got a descriptive rationale, so that's where it starts off. Um, we're going to keep that very brief, and I'll explain that in additional slides. Um, it talks about what the resource is, and then we're going to be breaking it down even further to talk about specifically about what overt behaviours we can um, sort of withdraw from the case scenario, link that to behaviour learning theory, and make specific links to uh, frameworks, principles, policies and practices to each scenario. Um, we're going to break that down obviously further as we go through the different case studies. The information below provides a guide to the key points to focus on. Um, collaborative discussion activities based on the scenario and relevant weeks will assist you. So we've had already, say for example, in um, in last, so this week's case study we had um, Robert and Tanya, who um, you know had some issues with some self-esteem. We've had some look at some bullying issues. So um, all of the um, 
activities within the learning materials and in the DB over the weeks is helping to prepare you for this particular assessment. So it's kind of like a trial run and a bit of a practice. So as I said, we're given a particular template which can be accessed through the um, assessment details itself. I believe that the link is at the end of um, uh, just after the case studies itself it's got something called supporting resources and it's called assessment to template so you can find it there um, I find that this assessment is really straightforward so you, we've got the template that we need to fill in it tells us exactly what to put in there um, it, it, it's very well laid out and very straightforward. So we know that we have to do 500 words and we're going to be doing that four times over. Um, we're going to be finding four separate resources which have four separate, um, I suppose, aims or rationale as to what it is trying to achieve which, with each of the different um, kids in each of the different case studies. So we're going to be linking to theoretical frameworks, principles, policies and practices, which we already know a little bit about because we've had that in assessment one. So the most relevant probably place to look is the Australian curriculum um, and also the early years learning framework. Um, might be a good idea to have a look at the age of the student within the case study because that might give you a better understanding of which of those two to use and which would be more relevant to the situation. Um, there could be other policies and practices too, but it would probably definitely be a good idea to link to the curriculum, perhaps as well as some other um, policy statement as well, like we did for assessment one. We're going to use the learning behaviour theory to support your analysis of the principles and practices being reflected in the resource. So this is where we're going to draw on the theories um, that we've covered in the unit so far. So we're only using the learning behaviour theory of those certain um, ones that we've been looking at for assessment one. So still those are going to be the same. We're going to talk a little bit about behaviour. And this is where it says identify a positive or preventative models of behaviour management and how it's reflected in the resource. So when we're thinking about, you know, a preventative approach to behaviour, we really want to think about how we can be a little bit more proactive perhaps and thinking about what strategies and what ideas and what um, tools we can have in place to be able to deal with this behaviour before it happens or perhaps before it escalates into something that's, um, you know, really hard to draw back from. So a lot of the resources that you're going to suggest are perhaps something that can be put in place to, um, you know, prevent behaviour becoming unmanageable or to decrease the incidences of those behaviours. Um, we're going to include an explanation of how the resource helps us to establish a safe, supportive and positive and productive learning environment. Because remember that it's the aim of what, you know, we want to do as teachers. So ultimately we want that safe and supportive learning environment, not only for the child in the particular case study, but also those around them. Because when there's issues with behaviour, um, you know, that affects that child and then it affects the whole classroom and it's taking up, you know, teacher time. So we want to be able to say that this resource is going to improve um, the learning environment for everyone and the child in the case study. In the discussion, think about how the resource will be planned and introduced in a learning sequence in response to the scenario and consider how this adheres to positive models of behaviour management. So we're thinking about everything in relation to the scenario. So what I would suggest doing is really try to envisage yourself as, say, the teacher in the situation. So you imagine that Janice or Bertie or Michael is one of your students. So put yourself in the in that particular situation and talk about how you would implement the resource. How would you um, introduce it? How would you plan it? How, do, how does it look as, as a teacher using that particular resource? How are you going to 
um, introduce it to the child, perhaps, say, in, in uh, Margot's situation. So you're talking about it from a really practical point of view. Um, it also says below, if academic underpinning is not evident, um, you're not past this assignment. I don't really want to cause too many alarm bells, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about some things that were mentioned in the tip sheet. So you just want to make sure that you've got good resources that have a good academic base to them and um, are quality resources. But obviously you can ask your ELA if you're not sure, but there'll also be some advice towards the end of this presentation. I really, really love this template. It makes everything so much clearer and easier to look at. So um, as I said, in the assessment details, it says assessment to folio template, and all you need to do is just download it and you fill it in, and this becomes what you end up handing in to Turnity. So within this first box up here, where it says resource one, that's where you put the name of the resource, preferably a picture to show us what it looks like, and then a hyperlink um, to the resource. I find it's always great to have a picture and a hyperlink, but it says one or the other if you can't find both. Hyperlinks are really important because if your ELA is not aware of the resource that you've chosen, all they need to do is click on the hyperlink and it takes them to the site and then they can get a bit more of an insight into the actual resource before they start marking. So we have Margot in this situation. What's really, really important is that this particular scenario is connected with week three. So I popped week three up here. And in week three, our focus has been on our relationship with our uh, with self. So that's the focus of that particular um, that's a, the focus of that particular um, learning materials and readings for that week. So when we're thinking about our resource that we're going to choose, we need to choose something that is designed for Margot, either to look at or to use, but it's something that has been designed for her to improve what's happening in a particular situation. So I don't want to read out the whole scenario, but in essence, when you have a look at it, it'll tell you that Margot's true, She's having a little bit of tr trouble transitioning into childcare two days a week. She's an only child. Mother's returning to work. She's refusing to eat and sleep. And she's calling out for mama and dada. Um, she does play well alongside other children and appears to be happy and engaging, um, you know, and, and can participate in, you know, those engaging social sort of um, parallel play situations. So when we're having a look at Margot, there's a few things that have jumped out at me when I've sort of gone back and had a look through learning materials, but also had a look at students who did really well last time. And I thought, well, what was it about their folios that made them so successful? So the first thing that they had to do was talk about the, the behaviours from the case study this resource aims to address. Now, a lot of them chose you know, obviously it needs to be age appropriate. So a lot of them chose things that maybe was like a daily routine planner or a visual timetable. Um, one of the students came up with the idea of like a comfort teddy bear. So there were all things that either Margot Margo could use um, as a comfort or things that she could use to sort of get a greater concept of time. Um, all of them were very specific in the behaviours that they discussed. So they talked about her refusal to eat, they talked about sleep, they talked about her emotional distress when crying. Um, and they linked all these sort of things back to the idea that, you know, there could be some issues with, an, say, um, like attachment or insecure attachment. There could be issues with self-esteem. There could be insecurity, there could be separation anxiety. So all of these sorts of things were sort of fleshed out in that first part of the rationale. So they talked about the overt behaviours that they could see and they drew these um, straight out of the case study. So don't um, say she could be doing this or she could be doing that. Just look 
um, specifically at the case study, don't make any assumptions, just grab the overt behaviours of exactly what she's doing and that becomes the basis of the first part of your rationale. And you're talking about some of the ideas um, as to why um, that particular um, behaviour is being seen. So you're giving a reason. Um, so there's obviously some sort of self-esteem or connection issue or some sort of separation anxiety going on for Marco. Um, she is only two um, and she's having a hard time adjusting to this change. So we also need to, after we've talked about some of the behaviours, is discuss the resource um, and how that's going to help to um, establish and maintain a safe and supportive learning environment. So for example, um, the student who was looking at um, a bit more like a visual diary or a visual timetable um, was talking about um, the fact that um, you know, the, 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 the student could be um, able to look at the schedule or look at the pictures for the day and look at the activity. Um, you know, they could be, you know, have a little picture of when they're dropped off in the morning and they could have a little picture of when they eat snack and they could have a little picture and they could take down the pictures perhaps of, as each of them was happening so that they had, you know, um, a greater concept of, you know, we're going to have a snack or we're going to read a story and we're going to have a sleep. But then when I do those three things, mummy's going to be back. So we're able to um, sort of nurture and support that idea that, um, you know, that parents will be returning soon. Um, there was also a good connection between, um, for our other suggestion, was also having a look at um, sort of like a, a caring toy. I'll just grab that. So the idea of like perhaps like, like maybe a security blanket or security toy um, could help to, um, you know, give some, some help and support and reinforcement of the schedule and give something as a support when there could be times of distress, which I thought was a good explanation as well. And it's preventative because if a child has a support or is it if a child has a visual reminder of what's happening that day, um, you know, that should increase or decrease the anxiety that the child's feeling and hopefully it doesn't lead to the behaviours that um, we don't want to see. So we need to be able to make connections to theory. So some of the examples that I was having a look at, um, it doesn't matter which theory you choose, you can um, choose to relate it to any theory, but you need to make sure that it relates to um, obviously the situation and Margot and what she's going through and your particular resource. So in some of the resources that I saw, the, um, for example, they related the visual diary um, more to like a cognitive approach and they talked about the preoccupational stages of development, how you can use your visual diary to conceptualise the separation. Others um, related it more to, say, behaviourism and the fact that there could be some operant conditioning, but then, you know, um, positive reinforcement going on there as well. So we're making some connections back to our learning theory behaviour. You need to talk about how the resource is going to be introduced. So again, I said to try and imagine yourself within that particular situation. And we do need to make some strong connections to either the um, Australian curriculum or the early years learning framework because she's two um, learning years framework makes sense and there's lots of good um, um, outcomes and different categories within those elements where it talks about strong sense of well-being and connection to others and all of those sorts of things are going to um, sort of weave well within um, Margot's scenario. So remember week three's focus is on self and we want to be able to um, choose something that's going to help support Margot. Week four is a little bit different because this time we're moving away from self and we're moving towards 
um, the idea of relationships with others and the resource focus is parent support. So this time we've got Janine and essentially Janine's having a tough time. She's eight years old. Her, did, her auntie and uncle have separated and she was pretty close to them. Her dad is helping out with the cousins and Janine's feeling a little bit left out. She feels alone and replaced. Um, and as a result, it's starting to affect her school and, and she's being controlling and bossy and, and she's taking charge of all the class tasks. They're starting to call her bossy boots. It's creating friction. Her teacher noticed her controlling behavior and has spoken to her at length. Janine is upset about this and has started to tell her mum that she doesn't like her teacher or want to go to school, which is a big issue. So again, that we need to be able to discuss those um, overt behaviours that you can see directly within the scenario. So we've got things like controlling, we've got things like yelling, and we've got things like um, bossing others around. And within that, we're looking at... Um, the theory side of things, um, you know, there is something tough going on outside of school and there's things that are tough in Janine's life at the moment. But we need to help the parents to help Janine to better cope with this situation. So we need to think about building resilience to cope with change. We really want to be able to empower children to manage their own emotions and we need the parents to be able to model this. So really, we all know that parents are the best, I suppose, um, the best influence over their children is that they, you know, um, you know, if parents can sit down or say Janine's parents can sit down and work with her through a few issues and support and provide some support, um, you know, this could help Janine through this sort of sticky period because we can see that um, I suppose there could be some connections to um, ecological theory where you know what happens in the home ultimately can you know trickle through and, and, and impact other sections of your life so in this sense of her school life so there could be um, resources out there that support parents to support their children better so you're gonna have to have a look around and see if there's a resource that could help um, Janine's mum and dad help their eight-year-old daughter to be better prepared for the challenges that um, are going to be faced by her. Um, and perhaps even get some parent, um, you know, there could be some resources out there that help deal with, you know, the controlling and the yelling and the um, sort of being overly bossy and, and dominating other children. So have a look around and see if there's something that can help with um, the building of resilience and, and to empowering kids to perhaps talk to other people or, um, you know, sort of develop their own emotions and take ownership of their own emotional well-being. I know a lot of students who I had a read-through of some assignments from last time, I think Kids Matter re had a good resource within there, so that might be a good starting point. A lot of them used um, lots of, again, different behaviour theories, um, some of them talked about, again, like within behaviorism and socio, um, eco, sorry, not socio, in ecological theory, like the, the connections between those different systems. Some of them talked about humanist theory and children um, being able to cope um, or being able, being capable of self analysis and how you can support this to foster their self esteem and therefore self actualization. The next focus is the relationship to the curriculum and it's based, this time we need an activity. And I've just seen that my week six slide has jumped in the middle there. So I'm just gonna have to delete that after this and I don't know how it got there, but it has. So just ignore that middle bit. Um, so this week we've got Bertie and he relates to the week five topic of curriculum. So within Bertie's, I'm just gonna get him up. Bertie has excellent communication skills, so he's above average with his numeracy and interest in anything scientific. He's four, year old, he's four years old and his parents believe he's gifted, but he's not engaging with any of the children in kindergarten and prefers to take on tasks by himself. So he prefers to sit quietly 
He likes paper and pencil tasks. His teachers tried to do different things, but it doesn't seem to go down very well. So he really needs to strengthen those social skills. So we're going to need to find something that Birdie can do. We really want an activity-based resource, something that's going to get Birdie better engaging with his peers. Because we remember from assessment one that we really do want to foster these um, peer interactions and social skills because we know that there's an element of success throughout life that's based upon this. So we've got things like, you know, if we're talking about overt behaviours, there's a lack of social engagement, not interacting with others. He prefers, you know, so um, isolation or antisocial behaviours. There could be an element of this later on in life. It could develop into different sorts of antisocial behaviour. So we need to think about what we could do for Birdie to instigate some sort of change and get him to see that collaboration um, can be worthwhile, um, you know, it can be stimulating and it can be academically rewarding. And you do learn from other people, not just pen and paper and sitting down. So we really want him to maybe role play or you know lots of things with group work or collaboration or when I was having a look at some old assignments I thought oh wow someone suggested some puppets um, to instigate a social play remember he is only four so we need to make it um, you know developmentally appropriate someone suggested a little science activity where they do colored flowers and they all had a different part of the group that they had to talk about so a lot of these social um, collaborative um, group work tasks were amazing for this one. Um, a lot of people um, made the connection to the early years learning framework in terms of social interactions. Um, there could potentially be some things that you could link to um, social capability as well. He is four years old so it probably makes more sense with the early years learning framework. Um, I can see connections here to humanism because all learning um, needs to be, um, sorry, the needs of the child need to be considered and all of the needs. We need to be able to um, build attachments to others. You can see that there's a socio-cultural element within this as well. There's behaviorism because there's learnt, perhaps learnt preferences that, you know, that he's developed over time or perhaps when he... Um, perhaps he wasn't encouraged to um, participate with others and was given the option to opt out rather than participate. So try and find something that's really fun and engaging for Birdie to do, remembering he's four years old, something that will help to get him to see the value of, of collaboration and want to spend time with his peers interacting. Okay, week six. This week we've moved on to Michael and we've moved on to the focus of class and um, community focus. So we want something that his whole class can do, groups, because um, Michael is in grade six, so he's around 12 years old. Um, unfortunately, the problem with Michael is he's taking a lot of days off school due to illness. Um, he's got a lot of... Um, so as well as the days off from school, he's unable to make real connections with his peers and as a result has no friends at school. His illness prevents him from attending school because he has to go to the hospital. Um, he could be in the hospital after two or three weeks. He has a school nurse, but now he's coming resentful towards his caregivers, teachers and parents and he's missed a significant part of the school curriculum. So my thinking here with Michael is that you know, I could just imagine from, you know, Paul Michael's point of view that if you've missed two or three weeks of work at a time and you walk straight stone cold back into the classroom, you've got absolutely no idea what's gone on in the time that you've been gone. Even if he had been given work to do while he was gone, you know, it's still very difficult for children to sort of catch up to what's going on. Um, and that's just academically, let alone friendship groups and these people have, you know, caught up at soccer on the weekend, so they're having a chat about that and these people are, you know, friends and it would be so hard to just, you know, 
get back into where he left off. So I can see how there'd be a big disconnect from peers and what's happening. So have a think about um, what you could do to perhaps re-engage Michael and perhaps maybe bridge that sort of connection when he had, well, obviously he has to go to hospital um, for that period of time, but what could be done to help sort of bridge that gap and help him to stay connected with his classroom? Um, I went again looking through old assignments and I found that some people made like great suggestions like Skype. So perhaps Michael could Skype his classmates and talk about certain different things and catch up with, um, you know, what's going on with, you know, different parts of the work. Um, another student suggested um, sort of like a, like a timetable board where Michael could um, access through the internet and see what was going on in the classroom. Um, you know, perhaps like, I think it was sort of like a Padlet where each different person could add different information. Uh, the thing I liked about Skype though is that it's a little bit more real, um, you know, talking to people and, um, you know, sort of making that connections where you do have to interact um, rather than just using a Padlet. So have a think about how you could, you know, sort of create that flexible learning environment which allows for, you know, perhaps collaboration and for Michael to be able to keep those connections he's made um, and rather than losing contact when he does need to be away from school. Um, the AC has some really good um, different elements to it that talk about, you know, the importance of meeting um, students' needs. I think there was a quote in there that said the needs and interests of students vary. Schools and teachers need to plan accordingly to meet these needs. Um, we want to be able to um, foster that sense of connectedness to school. And if you have a look at the FISO stuff that we had a look at um, a little bit with assessment one, you know, the student is in the centre of that particular circle and everything else branches out around them. And it's talking about the fact that, you know, student connectedness to school is one of the main indicators of success. So you need to feel connected to school and connected to your peers. Um, an obvious one is going to be socio-cultural, uh, I always say socio, so, social culturalism, because you need the social interactions and the imperative to learning. So Michael you know, he's at an age where that connectedness to peers is really, really important. We want to foster that self-awareness and self-worth, so perhaps connections to humanism might make sense. We need to prioritise his, I don't know if it's social needs or, you know, even just sort of basic human needs rather than academic needs at this stage. So we're not so worried about um, academic performance, we're worrying about fostering the relationships with others and building them um, to a certain level where he doesn't feel so disengaged. Resources, what can I choose? So obviously there's going to be a different focus depending on what week it is. So really essentially week three is going to be something that a child can use. Um, could be something the parent could use, um, particularly for Janine. We really want um, Birdie to engage in some sort of activity um, or, or perhaps a program. And for Michael, we're really focusing on some sort of um, task or program or object or whatever it's going to be that's going to help to um, build those relationships he needs with his, with his peers. Um, does it have to be something I have sourced or can I make something? The resource could be something you've made yourself. It could be something you've seen in school, um, an early year setting. It could be something that you found on the internet. So really the scope is really, really wide there, which is um, makes it a lot more fun because, um, you know, if you've got an idea of what could, like if you're sitting down and thinking, oh, I've got this excellent idea for Margot. If I had her, I would make this for her. And you can just... Show us what you could make. Um, it doesn't have to be something that you found, which really opens up a lot of scope to find and make lots of stuff. Um, 
the academic has given us a tip sheet which I've just pulled apart a little bit just to talk about um, here now. So we really do need to think critically about the resource. So we're not just discussing it. So we don't want to just say, this is a, this is a teddy bear, um, this is what we'll do. Um, we really are analysing it on how effective it's going to be to um, minimise or prevent those behaviours that we've been talking about and improve the situation for each of the kids in the case study. I want to think about the behaviours and how the resource can support the kids in developing their emotional well-being in a classroom context. So remember that we're at school or we're at the um, you know early years setting. We want to improve the situation for each of these kids, and we need a resource that's, that's going to support the kids in doing that. Um, we don't just want a quick fix approach, and what the tip sheet talks about. Um, in detail is, um, you know, we don't want to just say, well, I'm just, just going to suggest um, Michael go to the principal's office or I'm just going to suggest that he gets referred to some sort of psychologist. We don't want things that just sort of brush off the problem um, and don't offer any sort of um, manageable solutions because we're picturing ourselves as a teacher in this situation and we don't just want to brush it off or give a quick fix we want to give a resource that really um, fixes the problem or helps the situation for the, for the children involved. Um, our next one is don't suggest an academic resource. Now, what I meant by this one, I'm just trying to find in my notes, is that it does need to be something that's practical in its use. So we don't want something like we said before, like a referral or something that sort of shifts responsibility away from the teacher. We need to be succinct. We don't want to explain the learning behaviour theory all and what it's all about. So we can assume that the audience has this insight. So you don't need to tell us this is what humanism is, these are the needs, the hierarchy of needs. We don't need to re-gurgitate um, all of that stuff that would have been said before. We can assume that our audience already knows about these things so we can just jump straight into um, I can link my resource to humanism because and give you reasons. You want to keep your resource description really quick, um, really brief. That's the one in the first box. Um, it's just a little quick description of what it is. You want to save all of your words for the rationale. Um, it's only 500 words, so you want to save your words for that. We want to focus on a preventative approach which aims to reduce the behaviours and focusing on improving sense of self-worth and esteem. Don't choose something simplistic like a sticker or a superficial reward. So if we were going to say to Margot, Oh, I'm going to give you a sticker. Um, it is, I suppose, something that could be used in that particular situation, but it's probably not really dealing with the situation. Uh, could more so sort of be masking um, perhaps some of the behaviours. So we really want to think carefully about a really good resource that's really going to help to deal with the issues that are underlying. Stick to the information in the scenario and don't assume anything. So don't add extra things that Margot was doing. Don't assume anything extra. Um, we don't want to try and, it says in the tip sheet, don't extrapolate extra information or presume detail that isn't there. So they're detailed enough. Just use what's in the scenario itself. And don't forget to look back at all the learning materials because they're there to support you and they... The DB um, activities do help you to sort of break this down further and give you some practice. Um, I'm not going to talk about the whole rubric um, because we'll be here for a while, but essentially you need to know that we're marking you against these four things and um, there's different elements of this within the rubric. So we're looking at the selection. So there's different outcomes based on the quality of the selection of resources and how you've been able to link it to learning behaviour, link it to theoretical frameworks, principles, policies and practices 
and give example of practice in learning environments. You need to be able to show a development of resources and connection to the process of planning and supporting behaviour because we want to be able to support those positive learning environments to be able to have, you know, as because we know that that's ultimately connected to success within, you know, social success and academic success. Three, we're understanding the nature and development of behaviours in learners and how to respond to them appropriately. So... The responding part's a pretty crucial part, and it mentions this a lot in the rubric. So you have to think about how you're responding um, to the particular situation. So the behaviours are there, and we're talking about how we're going to respond to them. We have appropriate writing conventions, so that's your APA, your punctuation, grammar, spelling, and all of your personal literacy. So we have discussed our four scenarios we're going to use our template to submit to turn it in by Monday the 10th of September. And in essence, that is your assessment to folio. Um, please ask questions on your discussion board. Please seek out other advice. Engage with the um, description, the rubric, all of those sorts of things and definitely come to or if not listen to the recording of the interactive collabs because as I said this was just a starting point to give you some ideas that will hopefully get you started to think about A2 over the next couple of weeks. Uh, thanks for listening and I will see you in the interactive collabs.